Anyway, I suppose it won't surprise any of you in this room if I say that we're currently living through an information revolution with names such as these being familiar to you all. It's transformation of our access to information based on electronics, on personal computers, on digital media, the internet and of course the World Wide Web. Hundreds of thousands of words have been expended by journalists and bloggers and other commentators trying to explain what this information revolution is that we're living through, what its social impacts have been. And it's perhaps not surprising that quite a number of my colleagues in the history of science and technology all over the world have jumped on this bandwagon and started to write histories of computer technology, of the internet, of the mobile phone, of the software industry. So there's been a whole raft of new sorts of publications coming out on these topics. It seems to be fairly generally agreed that the origins of our modern information revolution lie somewhere in the 19th century, somewhere around about the 1830s or 1840s more specifically. And what I want to do today is tell you a bit about that period in the 19th century. I want to tell you a bit about what I believe is the Victorian Information Revolution, which is not quite the same thing as a lot of these historians think the Victorian Information Revolution was, as you'll see by the end. Now, the reason that most historians have focused on you know, the 30s and 40s in the 19th century is because the origins of two of the key components of the internet go back to their computers, and electrical communications, you know, sending electrical pulses down wires. I want to start um, with this chap here. In fact, you can see it rather better on this image. This is Charles Babbage, and this is where the history of computers usually goes back to. He was a mathematician, an inventor, living in the early 19th century in Britain, and in his day, the word computer meant somebody with a pencil and paper, usually. I mean, it might have meant someone with mental arithmetic, as we said, but it meant a human being. Somebody human who was doing calculations. But what Babbage did was that he drew up detailed plans for a mechanical computer, something using brass cogs and gears, a machine which would be able to do complex calculations, hopefully more reliably than someone with a pencil and paper could do them. Now, Babbage never got enough funding to actually build any of his machines, or he built a part of one, but not a whole one. But nevertheless, he's long been hailed as the father of computing for a theoretical demonstration that it would be possible to build a machine to do mathematical calculations. It was only in the 1990s at the Science Museum in London that a team of people following Babbage's in plans and instructions managed to build this. And it works. And if you ever go to the Science Museum, it's well worth going to see a demo of this. And there's actually a video of it on YouTube as well if you want to see it without going to London. It's really quite amazing. You crank handle on it, lots of cogs and gears go around, and it spits out the right number at the end. I think my predecessor in these talks would have done it faster. But nevertheless, <laughs> this machine can do it. And you don't need to be a mathematician to work this machine. You just need to know how to program it, how to set it up. So we now know that Babbage would have managed to build a machine if he'd had enough financial and technical assistance. That was in the 1830s. Now, the intriguing coincidence is that also in the 1830s, we have the origins of the other important component of the internet, the idea that you can send information down wires as electrical pulses, particularly using a code invented by a chap called Morse, you might have heard of him. He's quite important. Um, there wasn't a Mr. Semaphore, in case you're wondering. Um, now, electricity, uh, the electric telegraph, was one of the wonders of the Victorian age. The idea that you could send information faster than a speeding horse was quite astonishing to most people. It was even more astonishing. You could actually send information faster than a railway locomotive, and they'd only just been invented. With electricity, you could send, it seemed, information almost instantaneously. All, eventually all over the world. By the end of the 19th century, we get maps that start to look like this. If you've ever seen a modern map of where all the fibre optic cables on, that are the internet go, it's not dissimilar to this, but this is telegraph cables at the start of the 20th century. So we're encircling the globe in a web of wires. We're sending information down it as electrical signals. Um, now the problem with telling the history of the information revolution, the history of information in the Victorian era in this way, through the history of computing and electrical communications, is that we're of course telling our history. We're telling a history about what we know turns out later on to become significant, rather than a history of what the Victorians thought was significant at the time. If we look at what the Victorians themselves were getting excited about, I mean, they were quite excited about telegraphs, it has to be said, but 
they were also very excited about a revolution they saw going on around them. They talked about how authorship at the present day has attained a bulk that passes all measure. There's more and more writing out there. People say this about the internet all the time, but they were saying it back in the 1850s as well. Talking about the quantity of printed matter issuing from the press, it's something totally unprecedented. The relations of literature have been revolutionised. Now, this is the 1850s. They're not talking about the telegraph. In fact, one commentator said, this is even more astonishing than the telegraph. This is a different information revolution, one that's based on the printed word, and it's one that's based on steam, not on electricity. So I want to tell you about a steam-powered information revolution in the 19th century. It shouldn't be surprising, of course, because steam was the major motive force that for the 19th century. It was steam power that drove the mines and the factories of the Industrial Revolution. It was steam power which drove the railways and the steamships that transformed transportation. The early railways, this one's from the 1830s, went at the absolutely amazing speed of 25 miles an hour. Um, twice as fast as your horse, they got better. Um, this was an unprecedented speed for moving letters, people, and freight, including, of course, newspapers, magazines, and books around the countryside. And both railways and also, of course, steamships set a new, a new standard of reliability and punctuality that just had not been possible before. It really transformed the movement of information, physical information, of course, in this case, not just electrical pulses. Really made a big difference. By the time you get to the 1850s, it's railways and steamships that are the main ways of delivering letters and books and magazines around the place. Now, it is, of course, true that this is the time when the telegraph was getting going too. And, you know, I don't want to deny that. But I do want to say that the telegraph was not a significant information revolution for most of the population at this point in time. For most people, things that were going by railways and steamships were rather more important. Why? Well, one thing about telegraphy is that unlike the newspaper and indeed unlike the internet, telegraphy was essentially a point-to-point -point medium. I can use it, say as I would a telephone call, I can use it to call you or to call you. I can't use it to send information to all of you. Um, so it's, it, it's got that limitation in its use. And very few people would actually ever receive a telegram because the other thing about telegraphs is that it's incredibly expensive. You were charged per word for a telegram. You had to be sending something that was really quite important before you'd send a telegram, or else very valuable. It meant that the telegraph, unlike the internet, for instance, has remained primarily a business technology. It's used in co it, it was used in commerce by governments, by the military, but not that often by ordinary people. Now, it was certainly possible as an ordinary person to go into a telegraph office such as this one in London and... What you did was you paid your money and you had your message transcribed by a trained operator. Notice quite a number of women, in fact. An interesting element of gender history to this. But anyway, you had to get it transcribed by a specialist operator who would then send it off. You couldn't just write your message yourself onto the telegraph the way that you can do with an email or the way that Victorians could do with a letter. So it's, it's at a remove from you in terms of accessibility, never mind the price thing. So all that means for person-to-person -person communication, ordinary letter posts remained very, very important. And that meant railways to carry the letters around. By the time we get to even the 1850s, you can get a letter from London to just about anywhere in the British Isles, that includes Ireland, within 24 hours, which it's not much better than that these days. <laughs> for broadcast communication, though, for getting information out to lots of people, the main source, or the main medium, is printed word. We're talking about books, newspapers and magazines, also transported by those railways and steamships. And it's once we start thinking about the printed word as an information technology that you really start to see why it was a steam-powered information revolution. Because steam wasn't just important in the distribution of this printed matter, but also in its creation. Newspapers and magazines from the period. Now, the Victorians believed that it was only in their own era that the art of printing was being finally perfected. They knew, of course, that Gutenberg had invented the hand press back in the 1450s. But this was now old hat by the time in the 1850s because they got the steam-powered printing machine, such as this one. This was the final sublimation of the art of printing. This 
well, not actually this machine, but one not dissimilar to it, was first used in London by the Times newspaper in 1814. It was the first commercial use of steam power printing machine anywhere in the world. And it came into more widespread use, obviously, in the decades that followed. The big advantage of this sort of thing is, of course, it's faster. Even the very earliest machines were at least four times as fast as a, trained pr as a press operated by trained pressmen. By the time you get into the 1850s, the biggest machines, which then, as now, were the ones for the newspapers, this is the one for the Times in the 1850s, they were about 50 times faster than a hand press. This one was producing about 12,000 printed copies every single hour. Nowadays, they can do about 60 or 70,000 copies every hour. It's even more stunning. So it's faster, and of course it doesn't get tired. It doesn't have to stop for a rest break, as hand operators would have to do. And then there's the other thing, that it's cheaper in the end. Because if you look back at this image, you can see, well, I don't know whether you can tell, but they, these are not skilled operators. These are actually two relatively young lads who are just feeding paper in. Once you've set up a steam power printing machine, you don't need skilled labour to operate it. So your labour costs go down. So as long as you're running a fairly long print run, it's cheaper. What you get off this is going to be cheaper. And that's quite important. Because the steam-powered printing machine was important in the 19th century, partly because it allowed you to produce more copies in a given time. Obviously, newspapers love this, because it means that if you're trying to get you know, to press as late as possible with your news, and you want the newspaper on the street the next morning, you want to get a limited period of time. So if you can print more copies, that's great. Um, I mean, the Times circulation was only 10,000 at the start of the century. It went up to about 70,000 at the middle of the century. But you could also print more cheaply. And it was this cheapness that the Victorians got really excited about when they talked about their information revolution. Because the thing about print was that ever since Gutenberg, print had been relatively expensive. Well, I mean, relatively expensive. It had been expensive. It was a luxury. It was only for the relatively affluent. We're talking about nicely bound volumes such as these, a new book in early 19th century Britain would cost at least 30 shillings. Now, I know that really doesn't mean very much to you, but you'll get the idea when I tell you what some of these new books are going to cost. 30 shillings was a lot of money at that point in time. You'd have to be well off before you'd buy a book a month, for instance, let alone a book more often than that. At those prices, you didn't actually have to sell very many copies to make a profit. So if you're a publisher, small sales are fine. High prices, small sales gets you profit. That's fine. No problem. It was possible to buy classic reprints for maybe about six shillings, you know, out of copyright stuff like you get in your Wordsworth classics and that kind of thing nowadays. And that's obviously more affordable. But once steam printing came in, once you start doing those long runs on the steam powered press, you get bo small books that look like this, no lavish gold binding on this. These ones were selling for less than one shilling, so less than the 30th of the price of a normal new book. Oops, sorry. And you can also get magazines for a penny. You can get instructive tracts for even half a penny. Once you start getting printed matter available at those sorts of prices, and of course you're getting more of it because you're printing more copies on the steam powered printing press, think what that means for the amount of printed matter that's out there and who it's accessible to. So it's not just quantity, but it's also the fact that it's filtering down through the social strata much more than it had ever done in history before. And that's why the Victorians got so excited about the flood of cheap print that they saw around them. They were seeing that the age is unprecedented for the cheapness and abundant supply of its literature because those expensive books have given place to these much cheaper books which are accessible to all. So it's about, a, in our terminology, perhaps a, dem a democratisation of information. So the simple story of the Victorian information revolution would be steam-powered printing machine comes along, new technology, very exciting, leads to faster, cheaper mass production of print, which leads to the increased availability of printed matter, which includes lots of information and knowledge, of course, and thus an information revolution. But, I want to end on a but. I've still got, I think, about three minutes left, so we'll see what we can do. If you've paid any attention at all to the uptake of recent technologies, you should know that it's not as simple as that. Never as simple as that. New technologies don't gain immediate or automatic acceptance, even if they are technically better than their rivals or their predecessors. And you might cast your mind back to the oft-quoted example of Betamax versus VHS. And lots of people will tell you Betamax was better, but VHS had a better marketing campaign and they got more market share. If any of you are still using a video recorder, it's more likely to be VHS these days. Or think about the fact that we're all still using QWERTY keyboards, even though plenty of people will tell you that there are many better models out there that have much better for your wrists and more, much allow faster typing, but we're also using QWERTY. It's not necessarily about technical superiority here. 
We also know that technologies have a tendency to end up being used in quite different ways to what they started out, so that you get new uses coming up as people start experimenting with them, playing with them, adapting them. Uh, a key example from further back in history is a telephone, conceived of a business instrument, and yet now used for personal use and for trivial things like, well, gossip with your friends. And, you know, the inventors have no idea. Or more recently, uh, the success of SMS texting. The early mobile phone manufacturers said, well, who on earth would want a personal paging service? And now think how popular texting has become. So when we're looking at a new information technology, even in the 19th century, we should be thinking about these sorts of questions. Who was actually using it? Who wasn't using it? What were they doing with it? Um, was it being used in a variety of different ways? There's a much more complicated story to be told there. And I think it's especially important in the early days before technology has become familiar and you know, the one use has become established. Now, this is what my own research work is about as it happens, kind of obviously enough. I'm interested in the early days of steam powered printing in Britain, you know, right about the 1820s through to the 1830s. What was going on back then? One of the things that strikes me when I look at this is that we know about the very early adopters. We know why newspapers were interested, for instance, because it was faster. That's fairly obvious. We also know that the rest of the book trade took quite a while to be interested and convinced that this new technology was worth it. I mean, after all, if you're making profits from an established <coughs> method of selling small numbers of books to, uh, at expensive prices, why would you change that? You know, you'd have to think it's really worth it. So it took till the 50s. What was happening in between? Well, that's the interesting question. And it's particularly related to information and instruction and knowledge. Because what was happening in between is the people who were using it were people who had philanthropic ambitions, people who had a real commitment to cheap print and who wanted to use the steam printing machine for its cheapness rather than necessarily for its speed. People such as religious tract societies and Bible societies who wanted to bring the word of God to as many of the poor benighted souls of urban Britain as they could possibly reach. But also charities with secular ambitions who just wanted to bring education to as many people as they could reach, people who didn't have the advantage of going to schools. And there were also a few commercial firms, not charities at all, but people who happened to believe in the educational power of print and wanted to make that possible. And my particular firm is the one that printed this magazine here, W&R Chambers of Edinburgh. They're now known as Dictionary Publishers, if any of you play Scrabble. But back then, they were pioneers <coughs> of steam power printing. And it so happens they have this absolutely marvellous archive in Edinburgh that's got their author correspondence, it's got their accounts books, it's got receipts every time they buy a new steam printing machine, for instance, you've got a receipt for it. You've also got receipts for the musicians that they paid um, for their annual soirees, so you know that they spent you know, however much on oranges and strawberries and musicians for the soiree. It's through those archives that I've been able to piece together the story of why and how chambers were so early to adopt steam powered printing. And it's quite clear that steam printing was essential to the success of what chambers were doing. But it's also clear that it wasn't as simple as new technology comes along and they go, yeah, hey, let's have that. They had to make very careful business decisions about, why, about buying a machine and about how they were going to use it. The machine didn't operate in isolation. It was part of a much more complex technological and business system. And that's something that I'm writing about in my book which I'm just putting the finishing touches to, hopefully, if I you know, weren't worrying about other things right now. It's getting there. But you know, one of the ironies of it is that my book, which is about the flood of cheap print and about the Victorian information revolution, is probably going to have a print run of perhaps a 1,000 copies, which is the same as print runs were before the information revolution. <laughs> the difference now, of course, is that there are other methods of broadcasting information that you use for things that aren't academic treatises. Um, for the Victorians, there weren't those other things. What they had was print. That was their mass medium. And it was steam-powered. Thank you. Thank you.